So this is the part of our lecture, the second part, that has to do with some diagnoses. And today we'll be talking primarily about ADHD and uh, a little bit about intellectual disabilities and some others. I want to begin by saying I'm not going to have time to go over every single diagnosis in the DSM. Uh, you can research those uh, further, and I uh, I will try to uh, talk about the most common diagnoses that you will encounter as a therapist. Um, I will also try to post films and videos uh, about these subjects. Now, some of these videos may be controversial. They are to promote some discussion in this class. There are always multiple sides, multiple perspectives to each of these diagnoses. And um, I'm not saying any of them are right or wrong. But uh, you are able to disagree if you disagree with these videos. I will not take it personally or, uh, you know, I will listen to what you have to say. And, um, but if you disagree with something, then also please share what you do think about the subject and why. Um, I would encourage you to do your best not to take these diagnoses personally, even if you are diagnosed with one of them, any of them during the course, or if, um, if a loved one or a child or uh, a friend or family member has one of these diagnoses, I know it's difficult, um, and you are welcome to share your stories. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, a lot of times, like when, uh, I post a film like, um, The Medicated Child, uh, when, when we talk about ADHD, everybody knows somebody who's been diagnosed with ADHD. And, uh, in the United States, it is an over-diagnosed, uh, diagnosis. Um, the United States has by far uh, the largest number of diagnoses in the world, uh, like 90% of all diagnoses in the world, as well as by far the most uh, medicated population for this diagnosis. Um, about 90% of all medication for ADHD is prescribed in the United States. And what I'm simply saying is, uh, you know, I would, uh, I would think that no matter where you are in the world, most countries, most populations would have about the same percentage of people suffering from ADHD or any other diagnosis. What's going on in the United States? Now, just because I'm throwing that out there, uh, it's something to discuss. It does not mean that I'm saying your diagnosis is not valid or real. Uh, or if you have a child or a loved one, I'm not saying their diagnosis is not a valid diagnosis. I'm sure it probably is. If you know somebody who takes medication for this, I'm not saying that that medication is not valid. I'm just discussing statistics and, uh, you know, uh, differences between populations in the United States and other nations. Um, and what the reasons for these differences might be. So please don't take this personally if I discuss some of these larger issues. And um, I guess that's it. I believe that all of these diagnoses are valid. Um, and we'll talk about 
uh, how to make these diagnoses and what goes into them. So please do not be offended uh, or take these uh, discussions personally. Okay, so let's look at uh, the notes for ADHD first, and I'll expand that screen. So let's look at um, the criteria and how to differentiate between the criteria. Criteria A deals with aspects of either inattention of hyperactivity, impulsivity, for example, often talks to, uh, often fails to give close attention to details or makes careless mistakes in schoolwork, at work, or other activities, often fidgets with or taps hands or feet or squirms in seat. Criteria B, several inattentive or hyperactive impulsive symptoms were present prior to the age of 12. Several in the criterion C, several inattentive or hyperactive impulsive symptoms are present in two or more settings, home, school, work, friends, relatives, other activities. Criterion D, there is clear evidence that the symptoms interfere with or reduce the quality of social, academic, or occupational functioning. And E, the symptoms do not occur exclusively during the course of other disorders. There's three specifiers, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder combined presentation, ADHD predominantly inattentive, ADHD predominantly hyperactive impulsive. So when we think about this criteria, um, one thing that uh, is not part of the criteria is something that other European countries include in the diagnostic process. They use these criteria, but they also use uh, a separate criteria that looks at the severity levels of each one of these. So let me give you a hypothetical example. I have uh, a two-year-old um, and uh, a seven-year-old and a uh, nine-year-old and a 11-year-old. And um, I can tell you that all of them fit these criteria to some degree. And I would imagine every five-year-old does. So how do we differentiate? How do we make this diagnosis? And it's a matter of severity. It's that other element that is often missing in the diagnostic process. And so to what degree uh, does an individual fail to give close attention to details? Is it age appropriate? Is it not? age appropriate? Are they rushing to get through something so they can play at recess? Uh, you know, what's, what's going on with that? Um, do they have poor study habits? Uh, you know, um, so, uh, you know, there are a lot of different things going on with this diagnosis. One of the things that does not help this diagnosis are things like overcrowded classrooms, uh, the inability to give more individualized attention to students, uh, things like that. Um, the expectation to teach to larger state exams, the, uh, the need to uh, cut out recesses, um, so when I was in elementary school, I had three recesses and lunch, and uh, they were pretty long recesses. Uh, we also had a lot of hands-on learning activities, and uh, but uh, my daughter, uh, when she was in uh, first grade going into second grade, they had one recess plus lunch. And uh, 
I would have a hard time sitting in a seat for that long myself. So there are just a lot of other variables that we need to consider when making any diagnosis. This is just one example. When I started out as a uh, therapist, um, children were, were rarely given medication. And now, uh, 20 years later, 25 years later, uh, there's been a drastic change in the amount of medication used. Uh, in most European countries, medication for uh, uh, emotional diagnoses um, or psychological diagnoses uh, are a last resort for children under 12. Um, even with like bipolar, we would rarely give anyone lithium under the age of 18. Uh, now they're prescribing bipolar medications for children under five. Um, so I've just seen a very different uh, change in the use of medication with children. And I'm somewhat concerned about it because it only seems to be happening in America as opposed to other first world nations. And it's not because they don't have the resources. When we look at a physical problem that requires medication, uh, they give the same amount of medication as the United States. Uh, so for instance, if a child needs an antibiotic, uh, they prescribe it to the same percentage as the United States. So that's my little soapbox about medication, and it's just something to think about. And I'm I'm curious to hear your your reactions. Um, now, uh, in the in my 25 years as a as a therapist, I've diagnosed two children with ADHD. Uh, many many children. Uh, I thought the diagnosis was incorrect. The problem is they need a support network uh, if they're going to overcome these obstacles. Um, one example would be, I know that uh, in the public schools, my son would have most likely been diagnosed with ADHD. Um, every morning, uh, we started out, I wanted to find something that he enjoyed doing, and he enjoyed drawing. So every morning, we sat at the kitchen table after breakfast and drew together. And at first, he was able to draw together for 10 minutes, or color, depending on his age. And uh, But now we can sit and draw for an hour at a time, and he can also do that on his own. Um, and I'm certainly not saying that every child is like that or will have that same success or every parent even has the time to do that. It's just a personal example. Um, so let's look at some associated features here. Uh, depending on the age and developmental stage, the person features may vary. Frustration and related emotions can be common. IQ can vary, could be very high, very low, um, average. Uh, comorbid psychiatric disorders are common among children, uh, like conduct problems, substance use, anxiety, mood disorders. 54% to 67% of children with ADHD show oppositional defiance. Uh, associated problems include parent-child interactions, peers, academics, sleep, maybe a story of family systems issues. And as we go through these notes, if anybody ever wants to add to these notes, please, uh, you are welcome to add to these notes. Um, 
I just give these notes out as study guides uh, so that the students uh, will have something to, uh, to study. So the ideology, um, approximately 3 to 7 percent of children in the general population currently meet diagnostic criteria with the majority of those being boys. Symptoms of the disorder suggest central nervous system involvement. Many conditions thought to cause neurological impairment can be associated with ADHD, such as lead poisoning, chromosomal abnormalities, fetal alcohol syndrome. All of those things can be tested for physically. Uh, affected areas of the brain include the reticular activating system for attention, frontal lobe, voluntary control of attention, temporal, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, parietral regions, uh, involuntary attention. Yet research attempting to identify brain impairment has not produced any significant findings. Only those that show pervasive hyperactivity may show neurological deficits. There are no neurological assessments for this disorder. Some believe that food additives may play a role. Family variability seem to play a role, other genetically or either genetically or parenting styles. Uh, Barclay's neurological or neurodevelopmental model states that Problems in neurodevelopment caused by genetic and early biological risks lead to problems with behavior later in life. Heart of Barclay's model is the concept of behavioral inhibition, which refers to the ability to inhibit immediate responses, especially responses that usually provide immediate gratification. So really dealing with impulsivity and impulse control. Heredity. Evidence suggests there's a strong influence of genetic factors. ADHD can run in families. Eight, uh, so more likely to have a biological parent with a disorder, 18%. And children without ADHD, 3%. Um, treatment, pharmacotherapy or, you know, medications, first line of treatment for children with ADHD in America. Psychostimulants are the most commonly prescribed medications. They affect the neurotransmitters, dopamine, or epinephrine, cause increased attention and behavioral inhibition. Amphetamines, Adderall, Dexedrine, uh, Vivens, um, work to increase the release of dopamine from presynaptic storage vessels causing more dopamine output. Uh, Methylphenidate, uh, Concerta, Trana, Ritalin, Focaline uh, slows the dopamine transporter system that removes dopamine from the cleft, allowing dopamine to remain in the cleft longer. So two different ways uh, to increase dopamine. One is slowing the reuptake, and the other is to increase the release. Um, so, but you can look at these uh, criteria for medication, amphetamines and methylphenidate. Uh, so there are illegal drugs related to both of those. Um, these happen to be uh, a few molecules away from those. Um, not all children respond the same. Uh, discontinuation of the medication almost always results in a return of symptoms. Should be used cautiously in children with tics or Tourette's. Uh, so many children that I used to see, I, they would come to an appointment and I would see that they had a new tick. That is a very easy sign that their medication is too high. Um, and you want to get them on a lower medication before the tick becomes permanent. Uh, many families are reluctant to use medication. Um, let's see. Uh, Rather than behavior therapy, the most common treatment is the drugs. 
1980s, there were quite a few lawsuits against prescribing of Ritalin. However, most were dismissed. Ritalin has been on the market for decades. Patent expired 25 years ago. Use of the drugs increased 250% since 1990. Some studies indicate that 10% of all American boys have taken Ritalin for ADHD. Number of girls is rising. During 1990s, number of ADHD diagnoses has risen from 900,000 to over 2 million in the United States. Uh, 8.5 tons, tons of Ritalin are produced each year. 90% of that is used in the United States. So only 10% is used by every other country in the world. In 1996, investigation by United Nations International Narcotics Control Board concluded that ADHD may indeed be overdiagnosed in the United States and that many children who take Ritalin have been inaccurately diagnosed. One study found that only 50% of those children diagnosed by a pediatrician had undergone any psychological or educational testing to support the diagnosis. Many of the questionnaires used to observe the children are actually printed by drug companies selling the medication. There's current debate over the long-term effects of the drugs. Stimulants should not be prescribed for children with tics, glaucoma, seizure disorders. It's estimated that 15% of children with Tourette's syndrome might not have developed this disorder if the stimulant medication had not been prescribed. So that's... Uh, that's just a little bit about the medication. I did want to share with you um, what I did as a school counselor uh, to help students with impulse control, attention, and study skills. And uh, it was called the, uh, the STOP program. And we had, first we wanted every classroom uh, in three schools, elementary schools, to use the same language. We wanted everybody on the same page using the same language. Um, so all the teachers were trained, all the parents were trained, we sent home brochures, we had training seminars, we had posters in all the schools. Um, we had signs that they could color on every single desk. And, uh, of course, the first thing uh, is impulse control. So before acting, they need to stop and think. So the stop and think program. And uh, so the first picture was a stop sign. Before they act, stop and think. Second step, ask yourself these questions. What will happen if I do this? Will it be a positive result or a negative? Now, they might not know for sure, but just catching themselves before the impulse is carried out, that's a win right there. Um, if they predict a good result, well, then just go ahead and do it. And... If they predict a bad or negative result, then think of another choice. It's within their control. Part of it is helping them to understand that this is within their control. Now, I'm not saying if they had ADHD that it is within their control, but I'm just giving you a general example that we used with every student in a school system. Uh, if they tried it and it had a negative result, then they had to reevaluate and next time make a different choice. If it worked out well, they can make the same choice next time. So that's just a personal example. And um, I think uh, this is a highly debated diagnosis and treatment. Uh, uh, any medication for children is debated hotly. And um, I am curious to see your response to the two very different videos.
Let's look at intellectual disability, and there are quite a few different uh, types, but that is why I gave you the IEP form so that you'll be familiar with that. Um, this gives you basic uh, diagnostic criteria, deficits in intellectual functioning, such as reasoning, problem solving, planning, abstract thinking, judgment, academic learning. So there's a broad, broad spectrum here. Uh, criterion B, deficits in adaptive functioning that result in failure to meet developmental and sociocultural standards. Now the thing is, <coughs> the thing with this is there are many different subtypes of intellectual disabilities, a broad range, but um, this is more general. Uh, and I'm sure if any of you were teachers or have children or maybe you have uh, struggled with an intellectual disability, I know my brother uh, was never diagnosed, but, you know, he's older. They didn't have a lot of resources when we were in, um, in grade school, but he had a severe learning disability. He may have had dyslexia and and yet he was very intelligent. Um, but, you know, today we try to catch these things much earlier. And if the resources are available and provided, we see a lot of positive results. The earlier the resources can be provided, the better the results for that child. Um, so uh, there are just so many so many subcategories of this, um, but uh, they are usually discovered uh, once the child begins school. And um, so I'm not going to go into a lot of specific detail with these. All right, I think that's enough for this week, but uh, please post your comments and uh, be respectful, and um, I'll be looking forward to reading. Thanks.